Hello and welcome to this special edition of CU Science Update. I'm Brooke Cummings. This is the second of our three interviews that we conducted with participants from the 62nd Annual Conference on World Affairs, held during the first week of April in 2010. We are delighted to meet with Andy Anako, a tech columnist from the Chicago Sun-Times and Macworld magazine. Anako has made a career out of writing about science and technology. He's a regular guest on the MacBreak Weekly and this week in Tech Podcast, and has also appeared quite often on the CBS Early Show. Anako believes that he will be best remembered for having coined the term Macquarium, which describes an aquarium made from an empty shell of a classic Macintosh computer. Apple just released their latest computer, the new iPad. Does Anako think this new computer is the greatest gift to media on Earth, or a potential new aquarium? CU Science Update's Marissa McNatt finds out. Greetings, fellow internet weenies. This is internationally beloved technology columnist, Andy Anako. <laughs> what is this thing? What does it do? What sets it apart from the rest? Well, it's going to be a touch-based computer that has a brand new user interface so that there's not, there's not going to be a keyboard built into it because you're not going to need a keyboard. There's not going to be interfaces for card readers or accessories because you're not going to need it. It's going to be your one portable window into every piece of digital content you would ever want to read. So, with great drama, we will open the lid. Yoink! Hey, it's an iPad. Good afternoon, Andy and Echo. Thank you so much for joining us today on the CU Science Update Show. Um, so I understand that you're our science and technology writer. Can you tell us how you got into the field? Uh, well, it was more from a knowledge of science and technology than about any having a, any sort of a journalism degree. Uh, I had uh, been ma my major in the college was computer science. Uh, and I decided to, because I always enjoyed writing, to write about technology as I went along for, for free for local publications. And then after a couple of years, I started writing for money. And then after a couple of years after that, I started making enough money that I could forget about being a programmer anymore. Okay. So um, what was the first publication that you wrote for? Let's see. It was a user group publication for uh, a group of people in Boston, the Boston, Mass Ma the Boston Macintosh User Group. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the publication. I think I, no, it was called the Active Window, mm -hmm. and so I'd read, I'd write about the meeting every single month, and I'd write a couple of software reviews, and that would be about it. Okay. What was the first technology that you wrote about? Probably would have been about the Mac then. Okay. I'm trying to remember exactly what software it was. I think they first started me doing meeting reviews. Uh, I actually wrote a review of a little tablet computer uh, before there were really any notebooks or tablets mm -hmm. to speak of. Just a borrowed a little Radio Shack model to talk about. Yeah. What year was that? Probably, I'd say, 87, maybe 88. Seven. Okay. So Apple has come in you know, a long way and with the iPad. Could you um, tell us a bit about the iPad? Is it really as world-changing as they say it is? <laughs> maybe. I don't think it's, it's overselling it to say that it's the first really new computer in 25 years because first we had you know, mainframes, then a terminal that was about 20 miles away from there, and then we had everything on one desktop, but it was always keyboard, box, and a monitor on top of that. Uh, the only other modification we had to that was really just adding a mouse in 1984 or 1985 with the original Macintosh. Even a notebook computer was still, you know, screen, keyboard, and that's it. So when you have the idea of just a square of black glass that simply lights up and becomes any device that you really want it to be, from a word processor to a web browser to a mail app to a movie viewer, that is, and, and not only that, but an interface where it's just you're interacting directly with the content. You don't feel as though you're operating a piece of software that turns pages. You feel as though you're holding a book in your hands. That's a really big achievement. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really is the first breath of fresh air we've seen in quite a while. So all these technologies combined in one. Do you think that, say, the camera on the iPad doesn't work as well as if you had a device that was just you know, made to shoot videos? Is the camera as high quality on the iPad? Well, yeah, see, that, that's where you get into discussion of what, a, how Apple tries to define these devices really, really closely, where they try to figure out if someone has something in their hands that's, a, that's this big and this unwieldy, are they really going to want a camera on it? Mm -hmm. And also, what would it do to the design of the thing if we have a camera right up here? If I'm using it for like video conferencing, does that mean that I'm going to have to hold this up to my face? Or does this mean that if I hold it naturally, people are going to be getting images you know, up, up of my nose? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the reason why they decided to not even put a camera on this first generation iPad. Maybe it'll be available as an accessory later on, mm -hmm. but they really like to, they, I think they see every single new product that they do as like a character in a story that has to have a unique aspect to it and has a consistency in its behavior. Just like Luke Skywalker is not going to turn into a pirate because that's not who Luke Skywalker is. This mm -hmm. will not have a camera because that's not what the iPad is. Mm -hmm. So what is the unique characteristic of the iPad? 
just the it, just the way that it simply integrates into everything that you do. Like sitting right here right now, you could really have your notes right here on an iPad right here. Mm -hmm. Brass, if you had a laptop in your lap, that's too big and that's too obtrusive. Also, just in the way that you'd be using it in just mousing and keyboarding, I don't think you could really have a conversation with me uh, and still use this as your uh, as your note taking device and your note uh, note keeping device. Mm -hmm. I've been using this uh, for all my panels on the conference all week long. Uh, and it has an advantage that none of the other devices I've used over the past 10 years of these panels has ever had, which is it's just a flat sheet, of, it's essentially an electronic mm -hmm. sheet of paper mm -hmm. that's just out of the way. It mm -hmm. doesn't get in the way of what I'm saying, it just simply delivers the content that I need at the time that I need it. Mm -hmm. And that's how inobtrusive it is. Mm -hmm. So have you taken a lot of notes on your iPad then throughout the conference? Pretty much. Uh, I try to make sure that I don't look like I'm being rude and checking my email while, <laughs> while someone else is speaking. Right. But of course, sometimes they say something that really makes you think and you want to, they, they mention something you want to follow up on later. Mm -hmm. And once again, I flick one button, I have a, a virtual on screen keyboard that I can quickly type a couple sentences of definitely mm -hmm. look into this situation here, boom, click it back off again. You don't have to wait for a boot up, you don't have to wait for anything like that. That's, that's, that's really elegant. Well, what happens during the week if you were to drop it and break it or spill water on it? Would you just lose all of the notes you have as opposed to if I had a pad and paper, you know, I'd have the notes and I could spill coffee on it but still read them? <laughs> right. Well, that, that's, that's the classic problem uh, because those are permanent. Not only that, but obviously uh, if you, you know, packed up uh, all your notes in a box today and put it in a closet, 50 years from now, the, the technology for reading those notes, i.e. the eyeballs, would still be around and you'd still be able to read them. If I put this into storage 50 years from now, and let's say that the battery the battery died down, would I even have the technology to recharge this so that those notes could come back? But the positive thing about doing these things electronically is that if you leave those notes behind on a bus, they are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas this gets backed up pretty much every single night. It mm -hmm. synchronizes to my desktop really, really well. Uh, and also makes it much, much easier for me to keep notes that are going to be relevant to me uh, that I can have access to. It's one thing to take lots of copious notes, but if you wind up with a stack this thick and you know that somewhere in there is exactly the piece of data that I need for this conversation, but I, I don't have time to really get access to it, versus this device which has 64 gigabytes of storage, this particular model anyway, that I can essentially take any piece of research, any document that I ever come across that I find remotely useful or interesting can be kept on here, then I just simply do a simple search saying, Bogota, Colombia, here are eight mentions of it, great, I want number three, that's exactly the table and statistic that I want for the next thing I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So do you think that these could be a valuable tool to use in schools? I think so, absolutely, uh, partly because uh, Apple is sort of a controlling company. They don't develop machines that anybody can do anything they want to on. So if teachers and administrators wanted to make it into a low distraction sort of device, they could definitely do that. They could turn off certain features like texting, they could turn off the web browser so that they can only use it for note taking or only use like the, uh, the, uh, the math mathematical anal analysis app, an illustration app that the lesson is based on. Uh, also, if this is a relatively cheap device, it's 500 bucks. Uh, it is relatively durable too. There's, if you spill, you're not encouraged to spill things on it, but obviously there's no keyboard and no like you know, speaker slots in, in, uh, for all the liquid to sort of pool in uh, to the place. And it can actually take a bit of a drop. Uh, someone, there's always on, the, uh, on YouTube, someone trying to do things dramatic and silly. And so uh, this rare device that's been selling out, someone bought one at Best Buy, took it immediately outside and started trying to destroy it with a baseball bat. Uh, and the thing is, they dropped it from a, from a height onto the sidewalk, didn't break. Whacked it once with a hammer, didn't break. They had to sort of do a slow pitch, toss it in the air and hit it before it really started to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. So I think that's outside of the warranty use of the thing, but it's still a very, very durable thing. Okay. Um, so with its durability, ability to take notes, um, type on it, why would I choose to get a laptop then instead of an iPad? Well, because a laptop is a more, comp a more sophisticated machine. Um, Obviously, by the time you, if you're going to do any serious writing on this, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to add a, a 60 or $70 keyboard to it. It will use an external keyboard, but you're going to need a keyboard to do fast writing on it. Also, there are many times when you really want those USB ports, that card reader, that network port, that really uh, wickedly wide expandability. Also, you're limited to iPad apps, and there's a lot of them out there for a lot of different categories, but my favorite word processor is not available for the iPad, and that, for me, that's sort of the deal breaker. I use my entire life in this one application that lets me write everything from articles to blog posts to books, mm -hmm. uh, and without it on the iPad, that sort of limits its function. Mm -hmm. so. If I were to take the iPad out with me for a day, would I have to charge it at some point? Probably not. 
because uh, it has a very, very long lasting battery. Apple mm -hmm. promises 10 hours. I was getting at least 10 to 11 in testing. Mm -hmm. The worst I ever did with it was a little under seven and that was only because I, had the, I was deliberately trying to uh, kill it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So you'll easily get a full day's work out of it. Okay, well let's talk about what the iPad might do for the newspaper and magazine industry. Do you think it will help the industry? Definitely in that it gives uh, the newspapers and the, these publications a new way of reaching their audience. Uh, people have been pretty emphatically st uh, stating that they don't like print much anymore because it's, it's expensive, it's, it has limitations, advertisers are walking away from it, so they need to find a new way to get their content in front of an audience. And certainly having publications on an iPad is a big step forward because you can put things on the web, but there's really a very, it's a very difficult way, there's very, it's very difficult to try to find a way to get money from people uh, by giving things away for free on the web. The advertising just really isn't there online. But if they start to package these things as really well put together multimedia experiences where you have all the articles, but also full ambitious photo galleries, video commentaries, if it's on the internet, uh, at that time, touch a button and it will update things automatically with new commentary and community features. That could be worth $2.99 for a monthly issue. Mm -hmm. um, we're already seeing some of that, uh, even here in week one of the iPad. You can buy uh, Time Magazine as a digital edition every single week. I'm not sure they're doing it the right way because they're taking exactly the same content that they have in the print edition and, so, and charging uh, the exact same amount of money for it. So $4.99 for the exact same issue I can get on the newsstand. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think all publications are going to have to either choose to charge less money for it because you know they don't, you don't have to print it, you don't have mm -hmm. to ship it. Really, there should be some more money left over for, uh, after mm -hmm. that. Uh, either that, or just be so ambitious and say that we we're not going to be limited by the number of pages. If we want to put in essentially a 20-page photo spread, we can do that. Let's do those 20 pages and make it a really rich experience. Okay. How about for the radio and TV industry? Uh, networks love devices like the iPad because they don't like companies like Comcast and Verizon. Uh, and to get their content through uh, the cable companies, obviously they have to do big deals with them. Uh, and this devices like this will allow them to have all their TV shows delivered directly to the user so they can control all the ads, they can control uh, not only the ads but also knowledge of what this user is playing and what they're interested in. Uh, so as a result, CBS, uh, for instance, uh, remastered all of their content so that anything that streams uh, available through CBS.com can also be viewed in a special, it'll, uh, it'll automatically switch from the CBS.com website to a custom little viewer app uh, that goes in, uh, goes in that way. ABC has gone one better and has actually written an entire application that's a, just sort of a concierge to all the content that they've ever done uh, as streaming. So pretty much if you want to see last night's Jimmy Kimmel show, launch your ABC.com app, watch it. It'll be in high definition, it'll be on this nice large screen, mm -hmm. and this is really just the start of it. Uh, there's going to be more mm -hmm. uh, tablet and slate-like computers with other operating systems from other companies later on, and so partly they're investing in the iPad, but partly they're making sure that when this becomes like your phone, like a sophisticated device that almost everybody has, this will be a way that they can put their shows in the hands of people directly. Okay. Do you think it will cause people to be less likely to you know, watch that program at that certain time every day with the more flexibility? What do you think it will do for like programs in general? I think that's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. um, we're about to get our first, I think our first full generation who does not know that you're supposed to sit down on Monday night at 9.30 to watch The Big Bang Theory, that it's mm -hmm. just simply out there on your DVR and you can watch it whenever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so those of us who are, let's say, 23 and older, we're still going to be sort of, we, we sort of associate TV with an event that you're, at least our favorite shows, we want to be home to watch The Amazing Race on Sunday night on CBS. Uh, we, do, we can watch it on DVR, but you're sort of looking forward to it every week, and that's your first opportunity to see it. Mm -hmm. But once we sort of disconnect that behavior from people, it's going to be more important to make sure that no matter how this viewer wants to watch your show, you can make sure that that's available to them. Because the more you try to control their viewing habits, the more they're, they're just going to walk away. Mm -hmm. How about for telecommuting? Do you think it will increase people's ability to work from home? I'm not sure so much work from home, so much as work wherever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a device like this is kind of like an electronic hall pass. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a job where you are allowed to, you can do a lot of your work from home, but you just need to be in contact with the office and able to do things no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. But it's a nice day and you really want to be outside and really you finished all your work at one o'clock, so you really want to leave, but you know that as soon as you leave the house, you're going to get an email or, or text mm -hmm. saying, that, hey, come back. Uh, that, that that report that you filed needs to be changed or we just got new numbers in. This allows you to be at that Starbucks, enjoy your coffee, get that email, and then mm -hmm. still be able to make those changes because mm -hmm. this is a full feature
featured computer that can work with Office documents and work with all your project files. Mm -hmm. So you've had the iPad for about a few weeks before few weeks it's now, actually yeah. been, been released. Um, what would you say that your favorite aspect of the iPad is? I would, uh, now if I'm going to play fair, I would say the battery life. Because the I, obviously I've had I've had so many notebooks and so many little pocket computers. The limiting factor has always been that little clock that's inside my head that says that you have four and a half hours worth of battery. Do you really want to spend the next forty five minutes reading a book, knowing that if you need to write something or you desperately need to get some email, you might be down to zero battery? Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I absolutely trust that this battery will be good from sun up to sundown means that anytime it even occurs to me that I want to look up something on the web or do anything, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just dive into it. So that makes it inherently more useful. Mm -hmm. But the more playful and the, probably the more accurate answer is that I just love the iPadness of it. Mm -hmm. That there's nothing exactly like this. It, feels, it doesn't really replace a notebook or a desktop. It just calls attention to the fact that there was this gap in computing that always existed, or at least has existed since the uh, age of Wi-Fi, that this one fills in very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine not having your iPad after using it for a few weeks? <laughs> I can imagine, but it would make me very sad. Okay. <laughs> and um, speaking of books before, um, how would you say it compares to the Kindle? Do you think that if you had an iPad that you, there would be um, a point in having a Kindle as well? Uh, if you have both, there's definitely going to be a lot of overlap to there. So you, mm -hmm. I don't think that no one's, going to be, no one's going to be going to the store and coming out with both of these devices. Mm -hmm. But they're definitely designed for two different purposes. The Kindle is just a book reader, mm -hmm. which gives a lot of advantages. It means it's a lot smaller than this. You can fit this into a lot of back pockets. Mm -hmm. This, you pretty much need to have a case around it or have a bag to carry it around in. Also, the screen of the Kindle was designed just for reading text, which means that it's super high resolution, super crisp black on a, on a light gray background. The brighter it gets, the easier it gets to read because it's pretty much electronic ink. It works on the same principle as printed ink on a page. Uh, but the disadvantages are also pretty obvious. It's just a Kindle. It's just a book reader. Uh, it costs a lot less money. It costs $269, but that's all you're ever going to get out of this. This one, you can at least convince yourself that this will be my email when I travel. This will be my web browser. This will be my word processor. Uh, in terms of the experience of just reading books, though, I would say it's about on the same uh, the same par. Uh, this is an LCD screen, so if you're taking it to the beach, it's a little bit more of a challenge. It's still readable, but it's not ni nearly as readable as a Kindle. But I'm mostly in situations like on airplanes and on the sofa where I don't have a lot of light, so the backlit LCD is actually a lot better for me. Okay, so I think we have one a time for one more question. Um, so do you, would you say overall that the iPad is a product that you would suggest people would be useful for a person to own? Definitely, it's 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 not the one. It's not something you should be issued at birth. It's not quite that uh, important. But I think a lot of people who have desktops but never really saw a case for owning a notebook computer will say that yes, this is exactly what I want because I don't really need to do work uh, while I'm out of the house. But I'd want to have access to certain bits of services. And at five hundred bucks, at least it's within the realm of sanity for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas you know, eight, if it were eight hundred or nine hundred or a thousand dollars, you'd really have to be able to prove to yourself and your spouse that this is, going to, this is going to change our lives in a materially positive way. We already have the handy little iPad prophylactic uh, on both sides, sealed for your freshness, just like a bird's eye frozen dinner. Let's leave that in place just for now, because in case this is a well of the soul sort of thing, we do not want to release all the evil spirits that have been pent in here since January 25th, waiting to unleash their evil upon the world. Yes, mesmerize, 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 mesmerize. You can find a world of Anako at his website called Andy Anako's Celestial Waste of Bandwidth at Anako.com. Join us for the next edition of CU Science Update.